Financial Planner, Float on YouTube. I probably made money regardless just having spent those dollars in the meantime as opposed to putting them aside or whatever because the dollar is down 50% against Bitcoin in the last 12 months is what you told me. Correct. Actually, it's more than that. I haven't done the, the actual calculation to see how uh, degraded the, the value is. But um, if you think about it, uh, what was Bitcoin at the beginning of this year? A thousand. And here we are at three. So, you know, we've had that increase two thirds gain. And so that's basically a, an accurate measure of the amount of purchasing power that the dollar has lost. And you can do it, do that metric really easily because the greater percentage is the actual uh, loss of purchasing power from the dollar, not nominal, not notional, but what you could actually buy with it. Yeah. Anyone that's owned Bitcoin over the past year has seen their purchasing power rise. That is absolutely for certain. And now Bitcoin is almost daily uh, front page news. Uh, certainly at Zero Hedge, today we see Bitcoin spikes to new record high over 3,500. So I logged into. Uh, oh, seriously? <laughs> yeah, I logged into Coinbase. We're at 3,548 as we speak. Uh, I hadn't, hadn't gotten even into that far. I'm running slow. We were out of, out of the county yesterday, and so everything's like lagging. Yeah. So I hadn't gotten to that stage yet. But I knew it wasn't going to be down. Uh, the thing about the cryptos is that um, quite seriously, and I don't, you know, this is something that you will have to wait a little bit in order to see it happen. Uh, before you believe me, but we have not even had 1% of the population of the U.S. become involved yet. And I think we're going to cross the 1%, 2 and 3% threshold in a matter of months starting in February of 2018. So if you think it's hitting the mainstream now, you haven't seen anything. Now let's just uh, talk about that a little bit. I think that uh, February of 2018 uh, deadline is right around the time you're expecting to see a $13,800 Bitcoin price, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's that's been holding steady in the data. You have to understand we don't get numbers showing up every day. People think I can reach in and, and give them a number for a coin and it does not work that way. But when we do get a number, the supporting sets, it's like a descriptor set and, and it's the label for that descriptor set. So uh, as the supporting sets keep piling in underneath that. Uh, and so its pyramid of support is broadening. So and this has been going on for I don't know how long, maybe 12 months, uh, 14 months, something like that, that we've had these uh, descriptor sets uh, building and support under that. So I don't see any reason to, to think that we won't reach that. In between now and then, we're going to have a, uh, a big quick rise up to like 6,800 and then a, then a sort of a crashy couple of days it might lose 30%. Um, once we hit this like six, I think it's like 6,888. Why Bitcoin is all triggered or I don't want to use that word, but why it, why it pivots around 888 number, you know, uh, the eight number, I, I'm unable to say, but it does consistently seem to demonstrate that. And I so I think we'll drop down maybe as much as th uh, 38 to 40 percent and then back up in a few days and then off we go into February. And as near as we can tell in our data sets from this point, that'll be our last major pullback. Okay, and uh, let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin Cash. When I mentioned coin, uh, when I mentioned Bitcoin at thirty five forty eight today, that's to say nothing of your free uh, Bitcoin Cash uh, coins, guys. That you got if you held Bitcoin uh, right uh, through the fork there. And I, I'm not sure what Bitcoin Cash is at today. Let's say it's at two seventy five. That's just free money, and I'm personally going to let mine ride. I'm not, I've told this to my friends, just talked about it in a conversation with Joe and Brad Peters, the Intel software engineer, in a conversation we had last night uh, about that Lynette Zhang thing and the blockchain and the evildoers. So we can talk about that if you like. But uh, yeah. I told them I'm going to let it ride. I, I'm, I don't know what it's going to do. It could go to 10. It could go to 10,000. I don't care. I'm going to let it ride. It was free, so why not? Right. Well, here's, here's something about the uh, Bitcoin Cash uh, fork as well. Um, I don't know that, that the uh, thrashing around at the moment relative to price is any kind of an indicator for what will be happening with it later. So um, the political uh, machinations aside on its uh, creation, nonetheless, the Bitcoin cash now is an experimental test bed. Because there is less value that's locked up in it the way uh, um, we have with Bitcoin, we're going to have a freer attitude about implementing changes within the Bitcoin Cash protocol. And so I think to a certain extent that that may be a parallel, if you will, operational development test bed. You know, you shouldn't ever use any of those words together. 
but um, uh, but it may end up in, end up being that such that if they do have major improvements that they can demonstrate, you know, speed, et cetera, then those could be because it's the same code base quickly adopted into Bitcoin once it's been proven that the uh, net negative effect is essentially zero. Okay, so they've got a nice little test lab they can use. Yeah, and without much money invested in it. See, I mean, we don't have a huge amount of the of the market cap of cryptos locked up in it to where we're afraid to monkey with it. And that's a lot of it now. And I get that, you know, as somebody who hold it, uh, who holds Bitcoin and and uh, holding it through the fork, I appreciate that we don't have to be concerned about. Um, a radical element within the Bitcoin community saying, let's do this, uh, you know, major uh, choppy stuff on the code without understanding what we're getting into. And so uh, I like the idea that, oh, well, you know, if we do have a good idea, let's, uh, you know, let's let Bitcoin Cash do it and see what happens. <laughs> you know, let's let Mikey do it, right? Yeah. Well, let's talk about Bitcoin Cash as it relates to uh, Wall Street. Right now, the only way people could even get Bitcoin, if you're not going to buy it directly, uh, since there's no ETFs, the Winklevoss ETF was not approved, is to get that over-the-counter um, vehicle called GBTC. Are you familiar with that one? Because I want to read something to you. No, no, I'm not. I haven't run across that yet. Okay. Well, it's uh, it's just run gangbusters along with the price of uh, Bitcoin. I believe uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago, when Bitcoin had corrected back down to four or five hundred, right in there, you could get in on uh, one share of GPTC for under a hundred. I think at sixty bucks at one point. Uh, today it hit six hundred. So that is one vehicle to own uh, uh, Bitcoin through. Although you obviously don't hold the private keys. And uh, I was looking at some news today. I wanted to see how they were going to handle the Bitcoin fork. And without boring you to tears with all of this stuff, they essentially are saying that uh, the sponsor currently expects to cause the trust to liquidate any Bitcoin cash associated with the Bitcoin held by the trust and to cause the proceeds of such liquidation to be distributed on a prorata basis to holders of units of the trust. It is expected that any such distribution would be made only after allowing time for evaluation of the market for Bitcoin cash in consideration of the manner in which to liquidate such Bitcoin cash, which may be months after the fork occurs. So they're basically saying we may or may not. If you continue <laughs> right, reading, yeah, we're not sure. <laughs> it says, but we, we, we uh, what does it say here? It says the amount of any distribution will be net expenses uh, of the sponsor and the trust, including costs associated with liquidation and distribution. And basically they go on to say, and we may never distribute it. So I thought that was interesting. It's a little bit like uh, Coinbase, which got themselves in quite of a rip roar over this whole thing with lawsuits being threatened if they don't give uh, their Bitcoin cash to the people who did uh, hold their Bitcoin through the fork on Coinbase. So I wonder. Right. I wonder but how that shakes out. You up. understand about the exchanges, of course, and the and the double bind that put this that this put them into. Okay, and I'll tell you a weird rumor. All right, I heard a weird rumor that there was a, going to be an attempted takeover in an exchange because either because people were in, that were involved with the Bitcoin Cash uh, could foresee the situation, or they engineered it. And the rumor is is indeterminate. There's no real um, ability for me to validate it, but it sort of made sense because the the problem is the exchanges. Say that say that um, Coinbase. Uh, uh, let's just choose Mythical Exchange. Okay, so ME Mythical Exchange has got uh, forty thousand new people signing up every week, even or a month. All right. Well, we can expect that those forty thousand people they'll probably try and instantly on Exchange Mythical Exchange here they'll try and buy something. The odds are that because they're noobs, they're going to try and buy a Bitcoin or an Ethereum because they're scared of everything else. We're just uh, speculating here. But the net result is that out of this is that that mythical exchange should be able to make a projection and say, well, look, we're going to need to be able to service and supply these 40,000 people and we'll just concentrate on Bitcoin and say that among the 40,000 people coming in, they each got a, a quarter. OK, so they got to buy 10,000 Bitcoins a month uh, to supply this demand. And the fact of the matter is these exchanges, their profit margins, if you will, uh, are met by maintaining a pool. So when you buy Bitcoin on the exchange, they say, OK, we sold it to you. And it's not actually until you 
uh, take the Bitcoin and take it and put it in your own personal wallet on your PC, that an actual Bitcoin transaction happens because the exchange has got an algorithm that says, uh, ah, look, 9% of these people are never going to move it. Another 11% might move it. So we've got 20% to play with. So we don't even have to buy 100% of the Bitcoin. We only need to have 80% and then we can use the rest of the money that's being uh, spent on the Bitcoin as our float to cover our operational expenses. Sort of makes sense? Yeah, it's a little okay, bit well, it's fractional so, so reserve squeeze. Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, it is. Fundamentally, it's fractional reserve all coins. Okay, it's fund fundamental fractional reserve all coins. Unless they're going to charge you a straight up fee of X amount for doing the conversion and make the calculations on how much it actually costs them in terms of time, energy, and everything. Bear in mind, when you buy on Mythical Exchange, you get your Bitcoin nearly instantly, but the actual settlement on the Bitcoin network might take three hours if they actually purchased one for you. And so they're sort of floating it to you anyway. <clears throat> Under the circumstances, they got caught in a real bind because say if say that we're just talking with 40,000 people and they only had enough actual bitcoins purchased, they only had 80 percent. Well, they're only going to get 80 percent of the uh, expected amount of bitcoin cash. So they had to do one of two things. They had to get all those people off of there or they had to get a lot more Bitcoin. And you notice there was um, a push on Bitcoin, but there was not a huge amount of a spike in its price because there, even though there <coughs> were a lot of exchanges trying to buy, they'd done it in a reasonable fashion. Plus, there was not that much available to be purchased. So the price started rising up and they sort of slacked off on that. And then you saw a lot of brouhaha about, hey, get your Bitcoin and, and you know, get off our box. <laughs> before the fork. I mean, I had people sent me emails saying, what's this all about? And it's like they didn't want to be caught in the squeeze of then having to legally give you something they could not obtain because their business model prevented it. Make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does make sense. And I got mine and, off you know, of Coinbase. You can't, you can't blame them. They're not no. being evil or anything. They're just trying to stay in business. And they got caught out by this sudden shift that, that was sort of um anti-business model to them. Yeah. Uh, I got my uh, Bitcoin off of Coinbase about eight days before the fork i was really dragging my feet so i got it on a trezor and uh I, you know let me just say this and uh, compliment you on the uh, effectiveness and the accuracy of the webbot reports as it pertains to cryptos um we we're still off the mark on silver and we can talk about that in a minute and why you think that is but uh, <coughs> you've been on the mark so much with bitcoin that uh, i'm hearing cliff that people are running out and getting home equity loans and double mortgages and credit cards to go buy bitcoin I think that we it's very likely we'll see $6,888 Bitcoin and potentially 13800 potentially far, far higher. But don't, don't you think it's fair to caution people not to go That's deeply a, okay. into debt to buy Bitcoin? Yeah, I don't like debt at all. I mean, I, I hate it. That's where they have you buy the, the short and gnarlies, right? And so they're, I understand it. It's a natural thing. <clears throat> Those people that or leaning that way really need to understand they have to service this debt and then here's their other problem they may get trapped out in the sense that there may, may be something within the bitcoin um um not within the bitcoin community going on such that you know exchanges are having problems like they did now uh, recently with the fork or there may be some kind of fud coming from uh, regulation or something like this that would cause their uh, investment to go down just at the time they needed to liquidate some of it in order to um service the debt on the thing so I actually can't give any financial advice. I mean, in this state, I could be sued for advising people to do their money in any given way. But, I, but I'm philosophically opposed to using debt as a, an attempt or to being driven by greed to use debt as an attempt to make a killing in any market in any way. And this is how the um, touts take you and that this is how you are harvested. Uh, because people know that this is occurring. They know that there's this speculative mania moving up uh, within the population. And there are many people out there trying to scam you one way or another. And you may even see banks start advertising, you know, need a loan for Bitcoin. And it's like, boy, once that happens, you know, you'd better run from that because we're getting close to another large correction. And the idea of a Bitcoin ETF is really absurd, mathematically absurd. And the reason that it's mathematically absurd is because there's no way for that ETF, if it's an actual holder of Bitcoin, as opposed to yet another Bitcoin Ponzi scheme like or, or um, pool scheme like the exchanges, <clears throat> there's no way for an ETF to moderate these very large drops that Bitcoin has in its fractal pattern. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a chartist, 
but I know that the fractal pattern that I discovered a few years ago is um, active and it'll be scaled up. So as we scale up to higher and higher heights, we're going to have bigger and bigger crashes. So what's an ETF going to do when there's a 38 to 40 plus percent correction in a matter of, say, an hour or so, um, a consolidation or drop or whatever you want to say within the nominal dollar price of Bitcoin? The reason that this will occur is because the uh, death throws, the the uh, uh, you know, heart attack that the dollar is having is going to be violent. And so they're going to try and save the dollar and that'll cause, you know, the dollar to momentarily get a little bit of a flush and thus a rise relative to Bitcoin and then it'll crash again and then Bitcoin will gain more value and that kind of thing. See, so it's not Bitcoin being particularly volatile in and of itself because the way the blockchain works, it actually moderates out uh, wild fluctuations in activity or attempts to. But really what's going on is that, you know, the buttheads that are running the dollar don't know what they're doing. Everything they do aggravates the situation and makes it worse. And we all know that the trend is towards zero for fiat money. And we're getting really close to that. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you this, too, as it pertains to the accuracy of the reports. And uh, and just let you know that, again, as it pertains to me holding Ethereum uh, and Bitcoin, those two specifically, I, I also own Litecoin, Salt, uh, Pillar, a bunch of these others um, that you've talked about and some of which appear in your uh, your latest report. But sometimes when you're holding these things and they correct, it's sort of those white knuckle moments where you kind of feel sick to your stomach. And my approach is I don't even look at my account. I just look at the long-term report. And I know that, you know, if this thing is going to go to 13,800, whatever this correction uh, was in, in mid-July, and for instance, Ethereum corrected hard. I think it hit 420, and then it went back down to a low of about 140. Um, I held tightly. Because I know that the WebBot report has said Ethereum at some point here, I think you said 538, we can talk mm -hmm. about that. So I held on tightly. Um, and the reason I bring it up is because I have a very, very smart friend who people would know, actually, if I, I mentioned his name, uh, you'd know of this person. He's done very, very well in cryptos. He's an early adopter. And he was convinced that right after the Bitcoin fork would probably be a good time to sell his Bitcoin temporarily. He was convinced that there would be a big pullback because if Bitcoin couldn't get past that 3,000 high going into the fork and everybody who wanted it got in before the fork, he was convinced it was going to go lower. And he was wrong on that. And I didn't sell mine because I've got the long-term trend in mind. I'm going, I'm going to hold for that 13.8 no matter what it does. So, again, the accuracy of the report really helps people have confidence in just holding these things. So, long-winded question. Is that 538 price on Ethereum still valid? Sure. But uh, bear in mind, you, you have to ask yourself, why do you care? It is only valid if you're going to try and trade Ethereum and buy it at that level. And I'm not saying that that's the peak of its tooth. Uh, so in its, it, Ethereum's uh, fractal pattern is very much more violent, as we've seen demonstrated repeatedly, than is Bitcoin. There's also this tuple that goes on there, this uh, occurring of three times within its fractal pattern. And I expect that, that Ethereum will continue to demonstrate that pattern, although the, the uh, base at which these teeth are formed may widen out over time as we get get going and, and it becomes more stable. Nonetheless, though, the uh, correction ratio that we get with Bitcoin is in the 60 and 70 percent. So the idea is that, or excuse me, Ethereum. And so the idea is that when we get up into the 500s in Ethereum, the next time there's going to be a correction, you might be able to buy back in as low as, you know, maybe the 200, something like that. Uh, so it, it is going to have that pattern. The, of course, the issue is when is the uh, temporality of that going to manifest. And uh, that's really the tricky part of this. We're, we're in an interesting period of time. The reason that I can state now that the reason that the uh, crypto forecasts are so accurate is because I've lived through so many technology cycles, and that's what's going on here. And I would dispute you that your friend is an early adopter of, of Bitcoin. He's actually an innovator. I, I would actually dispute anybody that says, says we're out of the innovator stage because I don't see any of the early adopter language. Bear in mind, I was, I've was i been involved in the technology um, intrusion into populations in large scales. So, for instance, I've been involved in giant networks being set up for major corporations that would have uh, 100,000 or more employees. So that's a cultural center. And you have to, as the person that's in charge of not only setting up all of the equipment, but introducing it as a, in a smooth way into the culture and providing all the training that these people need, then you have to get to the point where you recognize the um, 
the flow. And you, and you, as as one of those individuals, I would actually look for the innovators in the early stages of the process and bring them in to be the cadre within that organization that then trained the early adopters. And then we would cross the chasm. The early adopters would get in there; they'd be happy with it. The innovators are always pumped up about it. But the early adopters are happy, and then there's this like period where it's just sort of flat, and then it goes mainstream. Okay, we're nowhere near that. We're just about ready in February, by the way I reckon these things linguistically, to take the step from innovator into the larger crowd that is the early adopters. So we're about from 3% or going from 1% to 3% on this. And at that stage, it's um, uh, once we reach 3%, We'll never go back. It's going to continue going and continue going. Once we reach 10% of the population, then uh, we'll all be involved for the next few decades, converting everything over, just as all of us became involved even peripherally as end users in the um, mass digitization of all the documents of government and folding all of that onto the Internet. So, uh, I mean, we all participated in it at some level. I was actually part of projects where we, you know, ran millions of documents through scanners and OCR and all of these scripts to extract all the information and that kind of thing. But uh, everybody at some level was was alive, that's alive now was in, in uh, the process of that. And so we're in that now. We're we're in the process of our entire human human society uh, eating the concept of money by software. Software is becoming money. Uh, it, our digital uh, infrastructure is broadening out into not only things on the Internet, but uh, the abstractions that humans use to uh, pass energy and relationships between each other. And one of those major ones is currency. So we've all known, at least a lot of us that have thought about this and have discussed it, that software at some time was going to come and eat the world of money. And a lot of people said, oh, oh, you know, digitized stock market and so on. And I said, no, there had to be something else. It had to be broader than that. That's why I was looking for something like Bitcoin without knowing what it was way back in 2005. And so when the, the white paper came out, uh, it was, uh, you know, the, the lightning moment. And there you go. Here it is. Software is going to eat money. And man, it's progressing very fast. We're about to cross into that, as I say, from the 1% threshold into the, the, that group that will ultimately yield us into the 3%. Those are our early adopters. I'm seeing the very beginning of that language being forecast for February. It will be, should become visible to anybody that's paying attention by about May. And so I have no idea at this stage because I don't have any numbers being offered as to what Bitcoin and Ethereum might be at, at May of next year. But um, we won't be talking the kinds of digits that we are now. OK. And uh, just two more questions uh, in order to be respectful of your time here. Uh, and the first question here is one that, you know, it's the type of question you got to ask because you don't want to ask it. I don't want to open up this whole Lynette Zhang AC chain can of worms thing again, because you were actually kind enough. You're such a gentleman. You're like uh, emailed me last night saying just a heads up. I don't agree with Lynette Zhang's position on this. But if you want to talk about it, we can. Uh, I feel like she's kind of been put through the ringer enough. And I did have a really nice conversation last night with Joe and Brad Peters. But let me ask you just in terms of the big picture picture. Knowing that I think JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or both have now patented some blockchain technologies or something that they're working on, knowing that the banks have done nothing but evil to humanity for a very long time, do you think it isn't uh, within the realm of possibility that the Bank for International Se Settlements and or the IMF could be trying to implement or hatch a plan to... No, you know, no, sorry. No, no blockchain that's, that's to ensnare humanity? Guy, sorry. There's... there's you have to understand the mindset of the people you're dealing with up there. These are not technical thinkers. They don't look for technical solutions. Technology scares them because it distributes power. The last thing they would do is involve any form of technology and any uh, access to any, any coin that they wanted to use to dominate. They're not going to allow you to get at it. <clears throat> Their mindset is entirely different, plus the stuff that Lynette's been – uh, given she does not understand and I think she's being played I say I say that because I saw briefly some of the video with no sound and I saw some images coming up that she had presented and I could not find them in the original Chinese video I so I some I think someone dubbed in some things to make her think that it's um a little bit more sinister than it is however that aside if my old eyes simply missed those two elements I was looking for still 
the super nodes, the description, all of this is just a, a pie in the sky by a Chinese company that wants to try and out dominate the banks. And they have no connection whatsoever to officialdom in any way that I can find. I, I was very upset personally with, with only the characterization, okay, that she didn't understand the um, information is neither here nor there. What I found to be somewhat um, uh, dodgy in terms of the the vibration it's putting out into the community was is the characterization of this company in China as being mysterious. No, there's no mystery there. You can find anything you want about them. They're not trying to hide anything. Uh, and the code segment that you presented that your friend from Intel popped up, that was filling an array with some values. I can write a coin and tie it to the SDR and it's meaningless, just as their coin is meaningless. And you'll note that there's nothing in their code that says go out and find the relative value of the SDR based on the formulas given by the IMF on these cur currencies. All it does with that little code snippet is fill an array for a display so that you would know what an SDR is based on, this this ratio of, or these these um uh, uh, fiat currencies, and it doesn't even give you the appropriate ratio. And those are all multipliers anyway. And the SDR is not a traded commodity in that sense. So yes, I agree with you. The guys at the top are a bunch of evil bastards, and we got to watch out for them. And they're sneaky, and they're trying all kinds of stuff. But their approach is infiltration, not competition. And no, they don't, um, if you can't beat them, join them. They don't buy into that kind of a philosophy. These people have a much more twisted mentality. So under the circumstances, it's FUD. It's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's being spread. The, the Chinese uh, coin, AC coin, is just like uh, if I decided I was going to take on the banks, I might try and do a digitize everything coin as well. Um, and I would put it on those kind of structures. The idea of the super node is... Um, uh, really anti-blockchain, um, uh, and it tells you right off the bat that these people uh, are basically scamming because they're going to run a centralized system. And they're claiming a connection to the SDR that they're not authorized to make, but they, the um, IMF and these people could not stop them if they tried. Anybody can make a claim that their coin is going to be hooked to the SDR somehow. So uh, it's a little goofy. Fiat is dying. Uh, yeah, the... Um, the um, Elite are trying to get uh, control of things, but more than that, they've got issues because the elite themselves are fleeing in, into crypto with their own wealth, and they're not trying to create their own crypto. And except in a couple of instances, I know of bankers that said, "Oh well, let's go, you know, do this scheme and harvest a bunch of money here." Uh, and I wrote about some of those in the Shice Coin section of one of the reports. Um, but beyond that, no, Lynette Zhang is a metals dealer. She has a, an alarmist uh, tone in terms of how she presents this material. Yes, the New World Order is a bunch of mean bastards that we've got to be careful of. Uh, but no, they're not going to eat everything with their software coin and tie up your property and all of this sort of deal. Uh, so her presentation is... Um, She's not the person to be judging cryptos, and the material that was presented to her, I believe, was done. That was it. It was presented to her. I don't think she ferreted it out. I don't think because, obviously, she didn't do even a cursory examination on the AC coin uh, company itself. There is no mystery there at all. Okay. Well, the one thing I would say, just to push back a little bit as far as the elite go and using technology to ensnare and enslave, is this whole 5G Internet of Everything thing where they want to chip, you know, literally – Billions of chips. They want to chip everything, every product, every living creature, and they want to track and trace everything. So that was one of the well, things. Well, that's not – okay, but hang on a second. Let's examine this from a very realistic technology uh, perspective. Uh, that's not out of line, all right? Having a chip uh, attached to your uh, cows, in, especially in Europe where mad cow disease is there, guarantees you at least up to the point of slaughter um, uh, what's going on. Plus these chips can be – Used as sensor apparatus. I was involved in this project where they stuck little coated wires in the snouts of all these uh, salmon fry and, or, and steelhead and let them loose into the wild. And for dozens and dozens and dozens of years, the state of Washington ran what was known as the head lab, where they took all these fish heads, extracted the little coated wires, read the digital material on them, and took the DNA samples out of those um, fish heads that they had, did the, um, uh, the electrophoresis on them, and came up with DNA patterns. And that was not part of any new world order. That was kind of a, a method for Canada, the tribes, and the uh, state of Washington, and Oregon, and some other states to fight over the fish. 
And so there are natural needs for us to understand what is going on at a cl- complex level as a complex uh, humanity, uh, as a complex human society. With or without the New World Order, we're going to need to do stuff like this just to be able to effectively manage our resources. And here's the thing. Say that there's a giant natural disaster. Wouldn't it be handy to have a, a computer somewhere that said, well, look, in the region that was just affected, we have X, Y, Z in the way of resources that have been wasted. But hey, over in this other region, we can look on the computer now and find out that we've got this percentage of excess, that percentage of excess, and this other percentage of excess that can be shipped into the devastated region. And we can do this because we can identify everything because of the chips. So I'm quite in favor of the Internet of everything, right? There are evil ways it can be used, but I'm actually a um, – I'll give you, I'll give you a, a family secret here, okay? Um, and it will perhaps explain my, my viewpoint. Um, uh, my people are pirates, okay? Actually, pirates of the Caribbean. My mother's family traces its, its roots back through the Azores, back through the Caribbean, back through the Azores to the expulsion of the Templars in France. They're hiding out in Portugal, their flight to the Azores, and then being kicked out of the Azores and, and taking up residency in the Caribbean as pirates. <laughs> so I've got pirates in my background, as well as horse thieves. And so I count on the fact that there's this DNA out there that affects people like myself that says, hmm... I'm going to game your damn system. So let the New World Order move in mass into the um, uh, into the technological world because you've got a lot of raspy old farts out there and young guys like, uh, that are all like myself that have the attitude is, you know, all it takes is a, is a decent PC or a smartphone and some smarts and, you know, yeah, I've got you. I mean, if you've ever messed around with the deep web, uh, you could probably get millions of people out of there to decide that, oh, under these circumstances, I think I'll join the collective fight. And some of these people are extremely talented. So I'm not that worried about them moving into technology. If the idea of putting a chip in me, no, that's not going to happen. Okay. And if they were to, were to put a chip into me, well, they're very easily defeated with a small, short uh, burst of microwave radiation that's targeted. And you can even find how to make these devices online. Okay. That, that was what I was going to ask you as a Christian. I wanted to know what, where you stood on chipping people because I believe well, that's also okay. what I'm not a, I'm not a Christian. I didn't so ask. No, I am a Christian. So. Oh, okay. That's okay. What, sorry. Uh, so I wanted to get your thought on do you draw the line at chipping people? Because they'd like, and correct, you just made correct. it clear. I, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, and uh, let's just uh, finish out the call then and talk about something that you and Lynette Zhang do agree on, and that's $600 silver. Um, why do you suppose the WebBot reports, uh, the WebBot data has not been accurate as it pertains to the price moves of silver and gold? Well, because, because it's manipulated at a level that I had not anticipated. But here's, a, here's another issue, okay? Um, uh, I was talking with some uh, kids and a couple of scientists about this. The accuracy rate of the data sets is a, it has to be looked at in two different ways. Uh, sometimes the accuracy rate is really phenomenal and the timing is really phenomenal. One of the examples is blondes on boats. The amount of language that actually manifested as the Costa Concordia crashed uh, and we and I said all this language would occur five months ahead of the, the ship actually running aground, and it was a, a spectacular hit. And there's been maybe two dozen of them over the past few decades where it was really huge amount of connection on the language, and it was precise on the timing. Now, there have been a lot where the language shows up, but the timing is just really wonky on it, and we might be a year off, and all of a sudden everything plays out just like it was described. And I think that's what's going on with silver. And I think what's going on with that is that there's been a huge amount of um, emotional, um, a, a suppressed emotional reaction to silver. And that's what's building up. That's what gives us the language the, around the $600 silver mark may be, and this is my personal fear, may be uh, something so catastrophic for the um, uh, fiat-based uh, economic system that that's why the, the $600 uh, uh, information came all the way back to 2002. So in other words, there's going to be such a huge emotional outcry as fiat collapses and, and silver is suddenly $600 an, an ounce on its way to, you know, infinity. Uh, there will be such a huge emotional reaction that that emotional reaction that we're about to encounter uh, and produce actually went back through time to influence our data uh, in 2002. Make sense? Sorry, had you muted. Okay, so 
Okay, so so under under those circumstances, that's really a scary time for me because what you know that amount of an emotional wave that it can travel back. Say it happens in two thousand and eighteen. Okay, we're looking at a sixteen year time uh, frame then from the event occurring, um, and then the previous. Um, description of that event showing up for the first time in our data. And it has held solid since then that at some point, all these linguistics are going to clump around $600 an ounce silver. And like I say, that stuff is very scary because of all of the other linguistics. Now, we're in that period of time now. There's no reason to be scared of it now because it's going to happen. We're going to just have to live through it. And we're also coincidentally picking up a lot of the um, ancillary sets of that $600 an ounce silver, which is the degradation of the infrastructure here in the United States, the political degradation, uh, the threat of nuclear war, uh, the strange energies from space, and all of this stuff that was all tied into that way back in 2002. And so that's really the, the issue there. It's a misinterpretation on my part insofar as the uh, propagation of the uh, emotional wave outward. My propagation studies when I did this all through the 90s had to be based on a growing internet, not anything stable, but a continually growing internet. And I'm convinced that the propagation studies, should I run them again now, and they took years, um, would yield a different set of metrics that I could use to fine tune my uh, predictions in a general sense, my forecasts. And the propagation studies that I did 18 months ago that allowed me to really dial in on the, on the cryptos have further convinced me that that is indeed the case. I was able to run a quick set of propagation studies over the course of about six months uh, based entirely on crypto language because the niche was so narrow. I could easily get the stuff in. I was just, it was just a shot in the dark if this would work, and indeed it did. And so there we are. We've got a... Um, uh, a, a formula, a formula for for approaching this that now has proven itself accurate for, like I say, at least uh, close to the last two years uh, on the cryptos, and extremely accurate in many cases. So um, that's that's really what's going on is relative to the to the forecast and so on. So getting back to the gut level that you know the um, th that kind of thing, if you're experiencing those kind of emotions relative to buying into cryptos, probably you shouldn't. This is one of the things for me is you buy it, you forget about it. You know, it's a long-term hold. I'm not into the trading mentality. And so that's really where the focus of our report is. Now, some of the people are pulling language out of the reports to do trading and more power to them because I know that I'm going to get, say, a 5% gain uh, or a 15% or 30% or whatever it is, whatever my gain is on Bitcoin between now and uh, the 13,000 mark, right? Okay, well, I know that there are people that if they trade it accurately could double or triple or, or quadruple the amount of overall gain that might be in that coin. But I don't have the stomach to do that, nor do I have the smarts. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm with you on that as it pertains to that 6,888 mark, right? I mean, you're saying there right. could be a big pullback from there. So, you know, if you had the wherewithal to do it. Uh, and you wanted to really gut check yourself, you could get out around 6,800, 6,900 and uh, wait to buy back in. You'd end up getting, you know, more Bitcoin. Uh, my problem is, is that historically I've been a terrible trader uh, with stocks. <laughs> oh, so I'm worse than you. I'm I don't worse wanna, than you. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to screw myself out of my crypto. So I tend mm. to just hold it. I white knuckle it, Cliff. Yeah, well, I see, I don't bother with the white knuckle because the value of the crypto, the nominal dollar amount is meaningless to me because I'm now shifting my mind over to the purchasing power of the crypto. Who cares what the purchasing power of the dollar is? It's kind of like when I was a kid, right? We went to Germany, we got uh, US dollars, we'd get finning from, you know, finning and marks from the German. Or you're going down to Italy and you get lira. Well, when you're in Germany, you don't give a, a rat's ass as to how many lira you get for your dollar and vice versa. And so that's kind of what it is, right? Unless you're actively going to sell at that point, that's really the only time to concentrate on prices. And like I say, I didn't even know what they were. I don't check them daily. Uh, you know, I'm, I could care less about the market cap. I've got other stuff to do. And the crypto world is going to go on because it's a technology adoption phase. Only it's for all of humanity on a primary uh, emotional kind of thing. And it's going to take decades, decades and decades and decades. So um, this is <laughs> this is like way early days. And the fact that you're discussing this now um, is one of these like generational myth things, right? When you talk to your grandkids or great grandkids, you can say, well, you know, back in the day, I was there when Bitcoin was born. 
And, you know, and here Bitcoin is at that time might be, you know, a million dollars each, something like that. But you won't care because it'll be actually purchasing power and you may not even measure it in the dollar because who will care about the dollar at that stage? Yeah, I'll leave you guys with this. You know, I guess according to Cliff, if you get into Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, any of these others today, you're actually still an innovator as opposed to an early adopter. That's how early we are in this crypto phase. Well, this crypto sea change, I guess, right? Correct, correct. Well, the death of the old system, and we're birthing a new one here, yeah. And that's why we've got all these birth pains, guys. That's why we've got the FUD, and that's why the system can be manipulated by people putting out bad language and, uh, you know, uh, funky trades on Ether Delta. And it's kind of like, eh, who cares about all of that stuff, you know? Yeah, Lynette Zhang is all upset about this, but she's wrong. So I'm going to go on and do some other stuff.